at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. We're here to run that alarm, make a friend in 15 minutes, and try and make their day a little bit better. Welcome to Pragmatic Paramedics. Here are your hosts, Aaron and Jason. Good morning, y'all. This is Jason with Pragmatic Paramedics. I'm here with Aaron. Got a couple days off and record this podcast. I'm really looking forward to this podcast. Aaron, why don't you tell us what we're what we're going to talk about today? Howdy, everyone. So today we are going to be discussing professionalism uh, in the pre-hospital environment. We have um, Chris Adams uh, and Sam. Unfortunately, Sam's not with us today. He uh, got stuck in some traffic where they live and wasn't able to make it down. But Sam and Chris uh, Adams are brothers, firefighters, authors, and uh, most importantly for the show, they're paramedics. They work in, uh, also reside in Colorado, where they work for a fire department as medics and firefighters. We're having them on today because they are the authors of Life and Death Matters, Professionalism, and Decision Making for the First Responder. So I just read this book and really, really, really learned a lot about my perspective on professionalism and things that I could change to potentially be a better medic. Talked to Jason about it and he had the book already. So we came to the conclusion that we would reach out to Sam and Chris and invite them on for the show. So you know, guys, thanks for, for being on, or Chris, thanks for being on, and uh, I'll let you uh, talk for a minute, and then we can go on to some questions if you want. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Sam was a, Sam wasn't able to make it this morning, but we will push forward. Thanks for reaching out, guys. I was really excited when when we got together, and I've been looking forward to having a chat with you for the last couple of weeks, and so it's really cool to be able to sit down and actually make it happen. Yeah, this book is really cool. I think that it's really unique because there's not much out there that discusses professionalism and decision making, especially in the paramedic role. But I think it also can transcend that and really be applicable to first responders in general. Just the idea of professionalism and moving forward in decision making isn't really addressed in medic school formally, at least. And if it is, it's a very short chapter or so Sam and I sat down and started kind of putting some ideas together and some thoughts about what it is that we think about when it comes to the paramedic role and how to function professionally, how we make decisions and how we act decisively and go out the door. And so it kind of through a combined effort, we were able to put some thoughts down on paper and I think it's been really well received in the first responder community. And really it's been, this book is fortunately, I'd never, I I didn't really know. We always talk about expectations. I didn't even know what to expect really, but it's been well received and it's also gone international. I mean, we've got book sales all over the world now, which is really awesome. And I think that it speaks to the uniqueness of the book, but it also speaks to the value that it brings that transcends specific systems and guidelines and protocols. Because that's not really what we're trying to address. So yeah. thanks for having me on guys. And I'm really excited to have a chat. Yeah, we, we are as well. So thanks for kind of expounding on, on the book and what made you, you guys decide to write it. One thing that I took away almost immediately when reading the book was humility and how that plays into being um, a paramedic, you know, to some extent, all levels of pre-hospital care. Clearly paramedics are typically leaders in their role in pre-hospital medicine. What I'm curious about is this quote uh, in the book. It's, I think, I can't even remember what chapter, but it's, it's toward the beginning where you say that sincere humility is one of the most critical attributes a paramedic must exhibit. If you could just elaborate on that and and why you you think that is and and how that plays into us being better paramedics. I think that's true. And I also, over the last year, have been really sort of 
reflecting on my own thoughts about personal character attributes and why they're so essential for us as paramedics. And so what we do really briefly is in the book, we, we set forth this premise of the integrated approach, what Sam and I talk about. And we're integrating medical principles, personal character attributes, and decision-making principles. And so with the personal character attributes, the first thing that we talk about is humility. Because humility, I think, is the most essential quality of a, of a paramedic and of a leader, which we as paramedics are. I think sometimes that gets lost, and I think that it needs to be formally addressed during internship that you are formally assuming a leadership role. So humility is essential because, so I've been thinking about this more and more over the last year. And I am more convinced that humility is, is, the, is one of the most essential characteristics because the way I describe it is that it's the, it's the key to your sharpness. It's the key to your kind of edge as a, as a provider. And it's that way because humility is the vehicle by which you grow. So you operate with humility and then combine that with reflection on certain components to your pro, to your practice pro, uh, personal reflection self reflection and then general reflecting on calls incidents and so what it does is it allows you to honestly and openly identify deficiencies within your own practice and what you need to do to become better and so if you function with humility you identify those deficiencies and then you develop a plan of action to actually become better and overcome those deficiencies and get to the point where it's no longer a deficiency within your own practice. And so what happens is over time, you're continually reflecting with a humbleness towards being better. And it forces you to overcome things that you weren't good at initially. And so now over time, what happens is you're you're slowly climbing this mountain. And, and then once you get to the top of this mountain, you're, you're performing at your peak performance. You're completely providing care at a high standard, high quality patient care, because you've taken the time to humbly reflect upon what you need to improve at. And then you do improve at it because you recognize that, you identify it, you execute a plan to become better. So now you're at the point where you're functioning at a high level, but that's not enough, right? We talk about humility being able to get you to that point of operating at the pinnacle of your practice at at the highest level possible. But if you don't remain humble at that point, if you don't continue to function with humility, you quickly fall. And it's not that you, because if you just stand still, everybody else is going to start to pass you by. You may still be standing still, but you're essentially falling backwards because everybody else continues to pass you by in their knowledge and their expertise and their abilities. And so if you continue to function with humility, you'll remain at the top because the complete opposite or the antithesis of humility, I would say is complacency. And so you can't get to the top of your practice and then think that you don't need to go any further, learn any more, become any better. That right there is the, is the hallmark of, a, of pridefulness and arrogance, which is the vehicle to complacency. And so if you get to the top and you don't remain humble, you become complacent and you start to fall down that mountain. And you quickly become, you, you quickly become a paragon. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you stop practicing at that high level because now you're arrogant and complacent. And so I think about humility as being the, the key, the, your knife's edge. It's what keeps you sharp. It, it's the vehicle by which you can always and continually practice high quality patient care because it allows you to ascend that peak and become the high quality provider. But then it forces you to stay there. Once you're on the top and practicing at that level, it forces you to stay at that level. Because you're always continually reflecting on what you need to improve on. That's just one component. I think that humility also forces us to become better decision makers 
better leaders and better patient care advocates. It allows us to always be trying to do what's best for our team and what's best for the patient instead of adopting an attitude of self-service, trying to do things that we feel we need to be, that we, we're, we're getting away from the idea of serving ourselves and trying to get into the world of serving others. So let me ask you a question then. Yeah. So one thing that, that I found wh- how, where I work now, so not previously so much in 911 street, as a street medic, um, is the action of following up on the care that you provided and, and realizing that you're not always going to be right. So you may have a patient who you've transported and you were under the assumption this entire time that they were in, I don't know, they were having some sort of MI, right? And you tried to treat them and it turns out they didn't have an MI and now your feelings are hurt because you were wrong and and you second guess, how does one go about kind of accepting humility? So a lot of new medics, I think it might be easier for them to kind of fit into this role where they accept humility and they understand that it's a huge component of being a better medic. What do you tell someone who's been around for a few years and believes that they are at the top of their game and they're kind of quote unquote a paragod. So what is it that they need to do to, be more humble or, or be, you know, have more humility in their approach to this, this kind of care? I think first off, going into the shift or going into the call with an, with an idea of trying to do everything you can to make that person's day better, kind of like what we were talking about before the show, talking about trying to make a friend in 15 minutes. If you go forward and try and try and do everything in your power to make the patients better instead of trying to serve yourself and get out of the call, get out of the work, whatever it is. This is why we talk about the paramedic having to operate with an integrated approach because this specifically addresses the idea of accountability. And so when you are accountable for the, for the decisions that you make, it opens you up for growth. And so, and that's the case. And we know that's the case because it forces the decisions that you make to be personal because it's a reflection on your own practice personally. And so if you think that you're operating at a high level and you're recognizing that some of the patients that you're bringing in might not, might not have the problem that you thought you were treating or might not, or might be more sick than you thought they initially were. And you're getting that information back it you have to you have to take that and be willing to reflect upon the decisions that you make and the and the information that you got that forced you to make the decision that you did in order to become actually better that's one of the biggest keys you have to be willing to actually take the take the criticism and the and the direction that the patient actually went and learn why they went that way and what information you saw that forced you to go a different direction and why, and then you can reconcile the two and become a better provider. So uh, one, I have one last question just about humility and I'm going to let Jason yeah. ask a couple of questions. I feel like we're kind of holding, holding the show uh, hostage and Jason's just sitting there. So I'm going to give him a chance, but no, I, it's all add, good. I have a question. So something I learned a long time ago, I had been a, a medic for a very short period of time. Someone taught me or, 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 or suggested this was, you can look at the cat all you want and the cat's going to tell you whatever your, wherever your municipality is using for codes, right? So maybe respiratory distress or shortness of breath or chest pain or, or whatever that, that, that cat code is. Their suggestion to me was do not read those. I mean, clearly you're going to hear chest pain, but don't start reading the cat and looking the patient notes up, go into it with an open mind because when you go into it with an open mind, you're less likely to make, poor decisions or be kind of tunnel visioned into my treatment is a because this is a chest pain because that's what the dispatcher told me in my opinion i think that is a precursor to being humble right understanding that we don't need to know all the answers right off the bat we kind of make our decisions on the fly sometimes and using your humility in the sense that i'm gonna i'm gonna go into this run thinking I'm open to accepting whatever the patient tells me, and that's the chief complaint. 
not necessarily the chief complaint that the dispatcher told me. I think that's true. I think that there is value to taking an initial an initial report of what the patient even thinks is going on. Because I mean, how many times do you go on? This is an example I use while I precept people is we think about shortness of breath, right? Well, how many times have you walked in the door and it's shortness of breath because of a GI bleed and they're hypovolemic? Well, they're, they're, it's a completely different pathology that's causing the issue, but it came in and coded as a shortness of breath, but now you've got to change gears and, and go a different direction. But I think what you're saying is true that you can't force that information to dictate your treatment plan. You have to force your assessment skills and your assessment of the patient to dictate the treatment plans. And so what we do is we get into the idea where if you get so consumed with reading the pre-arrival report, you, you become jaded because now you're trying to force that patient into something that it might not be what, what they need what they need. It might not be the chief complaint that they've described on the phone or the operator is taken. And so I think that that's true. I, I, I think that there is some value to it just in terms of preparing. It's nice to know that you're going on a pediatric respiratory as opposed to a 65 year old respiratory. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So there is some value in preparing your mind, um, starting to go through maybe some different drug dosages or whatever it is. But you have to allow the information to interpret itself. And this is where we talk about decision-making and the components of decision-making that we've set forth and also the different factors that affect decision-making. And one of the things that, that one of the factors we specifically talk about is something that you're just addressing is this idea of flexibility. You have to remain flexible to and open to new information to be able to make a more valuable or a more definitive decision about or accurate decision about what's actually taking place. Right. I think, I think that's, that's critical. Yeah. So definitely, you know, it's important to know what you're getting into. One thing we, we've discussed on the show was GSWs and scene safety, you know, knowing that you're going into a gunshot is really important. Like uh, you need to know that information, but do you really need to know where the patient shot kind of thing? I know that, that, that doesn't really, it doesn't change your, your treatment plan necessarily. So having an idea of what you're going into clearly is important and, and knowing that you're going into a pediatric respiratory distress versus a 65 respiratory distress definitely puts you in the right frame of mind, but having an open mind when going in there and going, I am open to this being a B or C now rather than just right. a right. Uh, what we, what, I'm, I'm really huge on what we call the methodical approach. We discuss this in, the, in our book, but being methodical about your treatment, your methodical about your qu- lines of questioning, and your methodical about your assessment is really important because that is where you're eliciting the information from the patient. You're not, you, you know what your approach is and you know how you're going to ask questions and what sort of information you're trying to obtain as opposed to allowing some third party to gather information that you have no idea what they asked to elicit that information or how it was communicated to the dispatcher or whatever. And so that's why when you walk in the door and you implement your methodical approach, you can be extremely confident that the decisions that you're going to make are going to be the right ones because it's reliable and you've done it in the past and you're not going to miss anything now, whether or not the dispatcher said this or that or whatever. So continue on the the trend of humility and and how it affects your decision making. Do you have any any ideas or tips for the those paramedics who are experienced but not you know they got three to five years of experience they're they're fired up they they're educated medics but they do you know how it is on an ambulance you, you go to yeah. those you keep going to those calls where it comes out as chest pain and you get there. And it's a ride to the hospital, so to speak. You right. keep getting those. How does it, you know, that wears on a provider's mindset of Definitely. always being prepared, always, you know, at, at some people reach a point of where, why, why do I need to study anymore? I'm just going to give them a ride to the hospital. What are some, some ideas that you have to help those medics overcome that mindset of yeah. they were humble, they were capable providing providing, and then they get to that point where i think we see a lot of medics 
where they are just standing still because of the type of calls that they have. Or, you know, 90% of the calls out there are usually routine transports to the ER. You know, 10% mm-hmm. of our calls, 20% of our calls are those true critical patients that need a life-saving interventions. How do you, how do you keep yourself prepared for that 20% when you're dealing with the 80%? I think that's, that's a great question. And that's one of the great things about this book is that we, we don't directly, we don't directly address that, but implementing the integrated approach absolutely resolves that problem. So what happens is I think the first, the first issue with that idea and that mindset is understanding the expectations right i think that a lot of times people have people have unrealistic expectations of what the job entails and of what they feel like they should be doing as the as the paramedic so i think that people have an unrealistic expectation on on the amount of alarms that we run and this and the clinical significance of the alarms that we run and so they get through paramedic school and they think that every single time you hear chest pain, it's going to be a 911 emergency uh, code three response and re, or code three return to the hospital is how we put it. But it's not right. It may be a very routine alarm. And so over time that begins to wear you down because you expect that you, you came into the job thinking that every call I go on is going to be an emergency and it's just not. And so having that unrealistic expectation contributes to that burnout in some ways, I think, because now you're not, you're not, your expectations aren't being met. What you want or what you thought is not happening. And so it's, it's contributing to your frustration because it's not something that you want to be doing is running these. Well, it's not that you don't want to be doing it, but it's that you expect that everything's going to be an emergency and it's just not. So I think that from the word get, we have to understand that the expectations have to be laid out, that not every call is going to be an emergency and there's going to be routine within it. So how do you keep your edge then, right? How is it that you continue to operate at a high level? Going back to what we were talking about before, that's where you have to implement the methodical approach. So, and this could, and this directly relates to the decision-making but if you implement a methodical approach on every single patient, it takes the subjectivity out of it. So when you arrive onto a scene and you start interjecting your subjective opinions about what's taking place or whether or not the patient needs this hospital, uh, hospital trip or ambulance, what you're doing is you're, you're silently frustrating yourself. Allow, allow your approach and your assessment to just be implemented and then the call is going to go where the call is going to go don't don't become frustrated over the patient that called 911 for non-emergency chest pain just take them to the hospital right oh, implement your methodical approach and allow it to dictate where what sort of treatment you're going to go with and then and then follow that through don't let your subjective opinion start to persuade you into treatment plans because that's where we can get dangerous if you're if you're if you have a command of it it's good but that's what we would call experience and intuition or gut feeling if you have a command of those things they can supplement your ability to assess patients but it shouldn't drive it because that's when you start to get frustrated that's when you start to get burned out so i think the first two things i would say is have a realistic understanding of the expectations and a realistic understanding of what the job entails so that you don't get frustrated on these sorts of things. And also implement a methodical approach so that one, you don't miss things and you continue to provide high quality patient care, but you also don't get frustrated when the patient calls for something that ends up not being as emergent as it sounded like that. Those are the two things I think that, we go through lots of lots of factors that affect decisions and subjectivity is certainly one of them because it, it can be dangerous if you're not allowing the information to interpret itself. So one thing that, that I think I've done over the years was accept that fact early on. And that fact mm-hmm. is I already, I, mean, I guess I didn't already know, but I learned pretty quickly that most of my runs 
were going to be less than sick patients. Likely, uh, they were going to be frequent flyers. I don't know what the appropriate or politically correct term for that is now, but high utilizers or whatever we're calling them. And knowing that I was going to be, in other words, just a transport to the emergency department for follow-up care and basically primary care. So that for me was substantial in me being a better medic. I didn't go into every run. I still don't go into every run with the mindset that this is an emergency and that I'm going to be transporting this emergent. I always go into it going, this is probably going to be just a frequent flyer and I'm going to go in with my eyes open. I'm going to ask all of the same questions that I do every single time, right? I'm going to go through my ABCs. I'm going to go through whether it's OPQRST or whatever you want to call, you know, your, your, your methodical right. approach and do that every time. And you're likely going to provide higher quality care because you're going to do you're everything sure. you're supposed to do and you won't miss steps. You won't yes. miss, you won't miss the OMI or the STEMI, whatever we're calling it now. You won't right. miss the, the crackles in the bases of the lungs. You won't miss the head bleed. You'll, you'll catch all that because you're going to go through methodically and assess every component of the patient, but you won't be so stuck, you know, tunnel vision that it has to be this now. And this has to be an emergent call, but you might find that you transport more sick people than you thought. They're just not sick in the sense that you were thinking. So I, right. I don't they know. don't need is essentially, I, I completely agree. And essentially what they need is a hospital and a doctor to give them a full evaluation, but they don't need us to, RSI them and innovate them right this second. Right. But they need a doctor to evaluate them and treat them for their sickness. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right, man. I think that a lot of people don't realize that you actually take a lot of sick people to the hospital. We might not be doing anything for them, but we might have found some subtlety that we can pass on to the doctor and be like, hey doc, I did hear some crackles in the lungs. I don't know if that's normal for them or that might be something you want to address. And then it comes out that they do a chest x-ray and they've got bilateral pneumonia and now they're up in the ICU for a couple of days. I think that doing that methodically is really a patient advocacy as well, because then we can really treat the person in front of us. And at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. We're here to run that alarm, make a friend in 15 minutes, and try and make their day a little bit better if we totally. can. Absolutely. So, Jason, do you have anything you want to add? No, I just want to. I appreciate the Adams Brothers book because I, I've I've read it and reread it for this interview, and the rereading of it and Chris's answer earlier to the question about how to stay humble and motivated in this profession with the frequent flyers or the high utilizers is is really hit me because. I've hit that three to five year mark as a, as a medic came in expecting to, to save the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you soon realize that you're not, you're saving some, but for the most part, you're, you're transporting a lot of people who may or may not be sick. Like you guys have, have mentioned, but it does start wearing on you and then it starts affecting your patient care. You're not doing that high standard. And uh, it's really just changed how I've practiced just doing this podcast and, and being friends with Aaron, knowing his background as a community paramedic and his focus on communication rather than clinical to a degree is, has really changed how I, I've, I've seen patients and I, I just appreciate that. And that's why I'm excited about this interview and relationship we're building with the Adams brothers. That's awesome, dude. You know what that is? that's a demonstration of your own humility as a provider, because now what you're doing is you're recognizing as we all do. And as we all must, we all have to recognize that we need to get to a point where we're, there's more to practicing as a paramedic than just understanding medical principles. This we're treating, we're taking care of people here. We're taking care of their families. We're taking care of people's, entire livelihood and that's a huge responsibility as a paramedic and it encompasses way more than just medical principles and so when we start to address that and actually understand that i think that the sky's the limit as how great a provider we can be 
I also feel like I'm a better person too, which contributes to the mindset and the, you know, the PTSD issue that's going on around out there. I've noticed the past month since, you know, I've stopped looking at these people as, you know, why did you call an ambulance? You don't need an ambulance to, you know, just uh, on Saturday, I worked in my partner. He, he was for sure that this person had taken all these drugs and talked down to him and, you know, questioned him, made it uncomfortable in the back of the ambulance. But during the, the ride into the cardiac center, I sat there and talked with him and I got done with that call. And I was like, man, you know what? I just, I just feel better. I feel better morally, ethically, just that I, I didn't talk down to that patient, but I actually talked to the patient or with the patient. Mm-hmm. And that I think that maybe contemplating that as a, as a bridge or as a help to the PTSD that's going on around with uh, first responders, that could be a, a good first step that we can control ourselves yeah. uh, on a day-to-day basis. So I just appreciate the, the knowledge, knowledge bombs that are in this 30 minute interview. Yeah. Hey, Chris, hey, you yeah. mentioned, you mentioned exactly what Jason is saying uh, in your three qualities of what paramedic, right? And, one of those, and I think you said, or you guys said, is the most important uh, quality a paramedic can have. And I think all EMS, because this, this isn't, although we call this pragmatic paramedics, I think this is, goes to all EMS professionals. Interpersonal skills, possibly, and, and if I'm wrong, let me know. Interpersonal skills are the most important quality is the most important quality that a, that a paramedic can have because it allows you the ability to communicate and yes. communication is in my opinion and, and it seems like yours and jason's too the key to being the best medic but also building rapport with your patient and kind of sub, not subjectively but objectively methodically going through the assessment and ensuring that what you're doing for this person is the most high quality uh, yeah. because you become you become, they become a person to you. Although, you know, some people will, will say, you know, you shouldn't look at all. You should, you should be less attached, which there's a, that's a whole, that's for a whole different episode, but you know, communication clearly, how do you, how did you guys decide that interpersonal skills was the most crucial to being a quality paramedic? I think, I think that that's a good question. And so, and I agree, interpersonal skills, are what we do. That's the vehicle that we have in order to actually treat people. So how is it that we can assess somebody and elicit information from them if we don't even know how to communicate with them? If we're not even being willing to sit down and converse with them on a real level and actually try and gather the information so that we can make an informed decision. I think that that's the start. We think about assessment as being a skill, right? As being a tangible skill, but an assessment's really, unless you're talking about a physical exam, assessments are, that's a communication skill. Because all I'm doing is talking to you, trying to gather the chief complaint or whatnot. So interpersonal skills are extremely important when it comes to us as providers. And I think that's why, because we can't, how are we able to treat somebody if we're not even able to communicate with them? So how do you teach communication skills? Because I think there are people out there in this field that lack the ability to communicate well with people. They just, they're great practitioners. They could tell you that this person has this process going on. I mean, like things that you, you're just like, what? I don't even know how you know that. But I mean, that's amazing that you know that, but you can't even talk to a patient. Right. So really, how do you teach communicating to someone and and let me just give some background so for me um, I started in the profession a little as a little at a later age and had a little bit more life experience so communicating something that I learned along the way but later on when I really realized that communication was important was when I became a community paramedic and was partnered with a social worker Literally, like that was the turning point in my career at, in when it came to communication because I learned very quickly that I can get more out of a patient by just talking with them than I can get by assuming or sitting in their airway chair with their seat all the way up behind them, you know, making these assumptions and going, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. I, now I always sit in the some people call it the compression chair or the, the seat or the, you know, the workbench. And 
I turn my body, you know, and my feet that is facing them. And I, I kind of slouch toward their, their level, like their, their actual physical level so that I'm eye to eye with them. And I have this conversation, whether it's for a five minute transport or a 45 minute transport. And I found that that is probably has made me understand medicine more than all of the classes that I went to and all of the clinical courses and all of that, because they tell you what's going on. And when they tell you, you, you can make a better decision for them. I think you're right. Well, to, to that, the, to that last point, I always say, always be asking questions because if you ask questions and you're actually paying attention to what the patients say, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. You just have to be, you just have to hear it. You just have to be willing to hear it. What I think communication is so cool. And, and I completely think that you as a provider will become better. One of the things that I say specifically, and we address this in our next book coming up is this idea of how to develop communication skills. So one of the things that you can do is if say, for instance, it's in a um, team environment is do something that has within your um, own team when you're bringing in the new student to train with you, say it's your firehouse or whatever it is, the ambulance, try and talk about things or do, do something that has very little little consequences and has really little to do with clinical in nature. So for instance, what we'll do is wash the fire engine and there's a lot of communication that has to take place in order to just wash the fire engine, right? Who's getting the water? Who's getting the brush? Where's the soap at? Hey, do you have this, the uh, squeegees? Where's the brush? You, you know, there's lots of communication that has to take place just in, just in that one little task of washing the fire engine. But translate that to the field, and what I'll say, the biggest thing that I think can contribute to developing your communication skills and also opening up the patient so that you can get better information from them is, first off, you have to be willing to offer information about yourself that has nothing to do with what's going on. So if you're, if you're able to have a more personal conversation with somebody it makes it makes communicating easier with them so trying to elicit some information about the patient that is that that doesn't necessarily have anything to to do with what is going on with them at that moment right ask them about their family ask them about their uh, family life their pets ask them about where they're from what they used to do what they do now it is when you do that you're starting to break down those those walls that we build up and those barriers that we have for communication. And so when you do that, and I'm sure that you did this every day as a community paramedic, because you want to get to who that person is so that you can better treat them. And then they're more open to actually offering information. How many times have you dropped off a patient? And the, as, as soon as you give handoff to the ER, the patient just starts listing the complaints and they're like, and this is going on, and this is going on, and this is going on. And for me, that tells me instead of looking at the patient and going, well, why didn't you just tell me that and getting frustrated with them? That tells me that well, I didn't do a very good job of communicating with them. I didn't do a very good job of asking questions. I didn't do a very good job of trying to gain their trust and the rapport so that I could actually treat the problem that now they're telling the doc. And I know that sometimes that's just because people are very much more comfortable talking to a to a doctor when the doctor comes in the room people are it's a known quantity i think mm -hmm. but i think that when we make things more personal it opens up those lines for communication definitely with patients do you want to talk about the book that's coming out yeah i'll certainly i, I can certainly do that and so sam and i wrote wrote life and death matters which was our first book and then we realized that what was really cool is that it was very well received. And so what we did was we sat down and we kind of developed our ideas and thoughts on what we specifically do when we train other paramedics. And so we go through a couple of phase process for assimilating into the team, assimilating into a role. And then also we discuss things that are crucial to paramedic development, which is we talk about communication skills, but we go into decision-making and leadership development. 
And so we set forth a, a four-step process for making decisions and then being able to identify where within the process are you having difficulty with making a decision and executing a vision or a plan for patient care. And then once you identify where in the process you're having difficulty, you can go back and identify or implement a plan to execute or implement a plan to actually rectify the problem in your decision making process. If that if that makes sense. I don't know if I explain that very no, well. No, I think it makes perfect sense. I, I, I guess I'm curious about a couple of things. Yeah. Do you have a title? We do have a title. We just sent it out. We just <laughs> sent it out to be called it's titled The Field Medics Workbook, a proven approach to training paramedics. Awesome. And what about a release date? So the goal is to have it out before Christmas. That's the goal. So it's no, it's the first of December, first week of de- December. So hopefully we have it out before Christmas. So in the next couple of weeks, right now we're, we're in the book making things that we don't think about, but cover designs and mm-hmm. interior formatting and those sorts of things are going on right now. The, the content is finished. Very cool. We're excited about it. I think it'll be a, a, a great follow-up book that we can, we can both read and then, and then hopefully you know, have you guys back to, to talk about it and, and see how it feeds into being a better medic. That's, I don't know if you know this, but we named the title of this series the Being a Better Medic series. And really, it's just our approach to, or our, our hopeful approach to teaching people, medics specifically, about being better providers, uh, being better medics. And having resources like your book, you guys, your second book, and other resources to make themselves better medics without having to look at, I don't know if we said this in this recording or not, but left bundle branch blocks. You know what I mean? Like without right. knowing all that stuff, can you still be a better medic without having to learn all of the clinical stuff? Yes. How that, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think that that was one of the, reasons that we wrote life and death matters in the first place was this idea that this reality that well there's nothing else like it on the market as far as literature is concerned and also understanding there's more to medicine and practicing as a medic than just understanding basic medical principles you have to have a professional attitude and you have to be a good decision maker i think that 90 probably I think you could say 90% of what we do as medics is decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just are making decisions all the time, all the time. And so you have to have a process by which to do that. If you mm-hmm. don't have a process by which to make decisions, you're going to become frustrated. You're going to become very nervous on certain calls. And then it gets to a point where you start to get burned out because there's so much going on every time that if you don't have a process, it's going to burn you out. It's going to just spit you up and burn you out because that's all we do as medics is make decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's why we wrote that book. And I think that it's been so well received and people have really taken a lot from it and it's been added a lot of value to a lot of people. So it's really fun to see that, but I'm really excited about our next book to see where it goes because it, it'll give, it gives people a tool for, developing and it gives people real tangible ways of becoming better so it'll it's i'm really excited to see where it goes i'm really excited about hopefully having you guys come back on and making this a a routine uh, event because i mean i've if people will pick up this book and read it and learn just as much as i've learned from this 40 minute conversation then it's a man it's amazing i really hope that we can make this a uh, routine thing because that this is this is the goal of our podcast which was the goal of your book was you know too many people think that you have to have clinical medicine and that's what makes you a good medic or that's what makes you the best medic and i, I i'll tell you i probably fell into the the same trap that a lot of other guys have thought and gals have fallen into before which is you know study clinical study clinical mm-hmm. and you know the routine patients aren't worth your time so after reading your book and talking to you, my practice is, is already changing and can't wait to hopefully have you guys come back on in a couple of weeks and talk about your new book and over the next year, just exploring more 
mm-hmm. topics within sure. this book because this book is needs to be a resource by anybody who takes their profession seriously and the amount of knowledge that's in it. We just barely scratched the surface in this interview. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I certainly think that there's, it would be awesome to have some future conversations with you guys. Cause I think that we all began and we all start out thinking that it's all about clinical medicine. And I don't want to on one degree downplay the importance of it because I think that information is what drives our decision making. And so that information is filtered through our understanding of medical principles so that we can better evaluate what the what is going on. So I don't want to downplay the importance of medical principles, but I also want to emphatically state that there's a lot more to being a very successful, confident paramedic than just understanding those things. Yeah, um, you can't use that. You can't use that information, the clinical information to treat a patient if you can't get to what the patient needs to tell you. So that mindset is definitely clear to me in the decision-making process. Is clinical important? Very much so, because it helps you understand what's going on physiologically with that patient. But if you can't talk to the patient and elicit that information or, you know, you blow off that patient or you blow off something because you've come in with that subjective mindset that you talked about earlier, inserted that into the the call, then you're not going to be able to use all that great clinical information you have to treat the patient. You're going to miss it and you may, you're not going to be a good patient advocate when you get to the ER and talking to that doc or the nurse and put out that little piece of information that that doc may be, that he may need to make a good clinical diagnosis of the patient. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I thank you guys for having a conversation and also thanks for doing what you guys are doing because I think that we're approaching a place where it is really needed to understand that there's other avenues and other tools out there that we can use to become better. And so thanks for doing the podcast and doing what you guys do. And no, we, we love doing it. So, I mean, we're here to, we're here to continue doing it and and appreciate anybody who's willing to come on and and especially you guys for being so uh, open early on. I mean, I think even before we ever even released a podcast, you, you, you know, yeah, for sure. We can talk and we, you know, we, That's we've been good. talking ever since and kind of yeah. just back and forth. It's been helpful. And, and, and all the reviews I've gotten from people who have read the book are very excited just about how it changes their practice. So just to, you know, uh, reiterate what Jason said, it's been, it's been beneficial to, to brand new medics and it's been beneficial to me, you know, with, with however many years I've had, and it's been beneficial to Jason with all the years he's had. So I can't, I don't see why it's, it's not something that should be in everybody's toolkit. That, that said, we should probably wrap things up and then set up time for a different, another day to have you on, you and Sam. I just really wanted to quickly just tell everybody that you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and also our website is field-medics.com. And so I think the best way to get a hold of us is either through Facebook or Instagram, but Shout out to you guys at Pragmatic Paramedics. Thanks for having us on. And it has been a awesome conversation. It's been really fun discussing the importance of some not often thought about principles of paramedicine. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the missed opportunities I think people have in becoming better medics are, are these. Great way to put it, dude. I, sorry, yeah. man. This is what's cool about these conversations. That is a great way of putting it because it, they are missed opportunities. I think that when we see those calls that we get frustrated with sometimes use it as try and change your mindset and use it as an opportunity for growth an opportunity to maybe dive into the subtleties of things and really figure out what's going on and an opportunity to become better. My, my, the most significant call in my career had nothing to do with medicine and everything to do with how to treat somebody Mm -hmm. and how to properly take care of people. And it had nothing to do with anything clinical. And so I think that it's really important that we understand that we're taking care of people and that we can do so at, at the same time, offering very high quality patient care. Absolutely. Maybe you can tell that story on the next time. Definitely. For sure. I think that's a great we'll do thing to look forward to. And I think that Aaron and I both want to support your book so much that 
when you guys get done listening to this episode, guys, head over to our Facebook page and enter our giveaway because I think we're going to give away a couple of the books to some listeners of the show just to support the Adams brothers and what they're doing. You're talking about this, this book or the, the new book coming out? Well, I haven't read the new book, so I really don't know what quantity we're getting there. I'm sure it's going to be <laughs> high quality from the Adams yeah. brothers, but I think, right. I think definitely a first step for a lot of people, especially I think t- to me, this book needs to be read by those medics that have been doing this for three to five yes. to seven years. And they're looking at, how they can change the profession or the profession's not what they expected and to read that book and to change their mindset because it's definitely changed mine. That would be, a, that's the perfect audience for this book. Um, mm-hmm. And like you said, you probably in the new medic understanding that, you know, 80% of the calls you're going to run are going to be routine calls transport. So with that, Chris, we appreciate it. We w- wish that Sam was here. And uh, yeah. we look f- forward to talking to you in a couple of weeks about your new book and hopefully some other ideas that have come out of the life and death matters book. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having us on. And yeah, we'll certainly be back. Great time talking with you both. So appreciate your time. Hey, Chris, thank you. Uh, thanks to field medics for coming on. I always want to thank our, our supporters. We have a couple, so I'll just do a, a, a shout out to them. So Lalo tactical, Arctic now you can you can kind of look at some of their stuff for keeping yourself hydrated and, and again that's always a, a practice that that's overlooked black wolf helicopters and of course my medic and we will be with you in a week thank you thanks for listening and follow us on facebook twitter and instagram also be sure to check out and support our sponsors on our website